The Acolyte showrunner Leslie Hedlund has claimed that the reason that OSHA killed Soul is because Soul was imposing benign sexism on her. You literally cannot make this stuff up. Furthermore, we find out that this all is, <laughs> this entire show is like a therapy session for Leslie Hedlund and Lucasfilm gave her $180 million to work out her own personal problems. Before we get to this, I'd like to ask you, please hit that subscribe button, hit that bell for notifications so you don't miss any of our future videos here at The Trump Report. Also, hit that like button. Let's beat the YouTube algorithm and get more people to view this video. I wrote this up over at thatparkplace.com and Hedlund did a post season one interview with Collider and discussed uh, how OSHA killed Soul in the final episode. So if you haven't watched the show, <clears throat> basically what happens is Soul confirms to May and Chimere that he killed Mother and Asaya. Osha overhears the conversation and then confronts him. However, Soul makes it clear what he did was the right thing to do and that he did not inform the Jedi because he was trying to protect Osha and she would have been sent away because she was too old to train and would have never been allowed to become a Jedi. He goes on to tell her that he did everything because he loved her. However, the word love is cut off and Osha begins to use the force to choke him. As he's being choked, he does eventually regain his voice and he tells her it's okay. Osha then kills him with a force choke. So in this interview with Collider, Maggie Lovett, the interviewer, asked Hedlund this. What's so interesting about that moment where Osha kills Soul is how much is conveyed even while he's choking on his words. Also, and maybe this was my impression of it, but my first thought was he doesn't even give her the agency to make this choice herself because he's accepting his fate. It just adds so much more insult to injury. You can't even let her get a satisfactory kill because you're like, it's okay. It's so good. I mean, what kind of deranged individual even says something like that, that uh, she doesn't have agency when she's literally choking the force out of the guy, choking the life force out of the guy. Yeah, this is deranged absolutely deranged person says something like that nevertheless this is what Hedlund responded we also knew that it was always going to be the betrayal of the father and i knew we had to juxtapose luke's forgiveness and vader's redemption we're like this is a story about the sith so that's not gonna happen what betrayal of the father soul did not betray osha at all her mother was a demonic witch type being and uh, he killed her and he even says he was right so there was absolutely no betrayal she's being brainwashed into a witch coven and he was right to uh, excise her from that witch coven heaven then goes on and says this you're absolutely right there's this thing that's called benign sexism and part of it is this paternal protectionism it seems like this good thing but like you said, there's this. I have to protect you from everything. I have to make sure you're okay. I have to tell you what track to get on. And then once you're on that track, I need to support you. Ultimately, what happens is, again, this is a father-daughter relationship. As women evolve in their lives and develop their own personalities separate from their fathers, at some point, they have to reject that protectionism. None of this makes any sense whatsoever if you actually watch the show. Osha washed out of the Jedi She's seemingly been washed out for a number of years now. Sol has had zero contact with her until Vernestra brings him in to investigate a murder based on the fact that the description looks like Osha. The murder suspect's description looks like Osha. So what is she even talking about here? There is no paternal protectionism. She's off doing her own thing, welding ships in space providing maintenance, working on some kind of maintenance crew for the Trade Federation. And Sol isn't even... Sol is... Does, she's moved on, almost. Like, this whole father-daughter relationship thing, it literally doesn't exist until you have the flashback episodes at the very end of the show. The, the, the flashback episode in episode 7. And then, I guess, in episode 8, as well. So this idea that he's engaging in this benign sexism doesn't even make sense at all either, even if you watch the actual show. She's literally just making things up. She continues saying, again, I'm so proud of it. 
I have so many favorite moments in the show. I have like a hundred and I'm happy to go through all of them now. One of my favorite moments is when he says, I did everything because I love, he's going to say, I love you. And not only is that a level of attachment that an unbalanced Jedi would have, he very clearly is losing it in the last half of the season, but that's also the justification for that kind of behavior between the father and the daughter. So first off, actually loving would not make you unbalanced. This is something that we discover in the original trilogy. This kind of ban on love is shown to be one of the reasons why the Jedi are usurped by the Sith. And Luke Skywalker is the one who has to show them that love is something that they should be embracing. And he does that by loving his father. And that is how he actually defeats Sidious. He defeats Sidious through love, through willing the good of his father, through sacrificing himself, through his self-love. He's not going, he loves himself so much, he's not going to give in to evil, give in to hate. He would rather die than to do that. He loves himself so much. And then that act of love that, that he's showing inspires Vader, who sees that, loves his son, sees his son dying, kills Sidious throws him down the shaft of the Death Star. So this idea that <laughs> having love, this which, which is to will the good of another, having this love is, is not something that would be, make you unbalanced. It's actually something that was missing and was making the Jedi unbalanced. This lack of love was making them unbalanced because they were trying to excise it uh, from themselves. And that made them actually uh, unbalanced internally and allowed the, the dark side to creep in, cloud their vision, etc. because they were tacitly embracing the dark side there and they just didn't re even realize it so she's completely off the mark there the daughter has to surpass him in some way she cannot stay a little girl or an adolescent or young adult she has to at some point say i reject what you have told me i need to do to make you proud to follow in your footsteps she has to do that that's that's utterly ridiculous i, I am a father of a daughter and obviously my daughter hasn't gotten to this point where I'm I'm going to be walking her down the aisle or anything like that. But this idea that the that your daughter has to like reject you, it, it's just utterly absurd on its face. It does it just does not even make sense. Again, I think this is Leslie Headland projecting herself into the story. You can look at uh Mary, mother of God daughter of God as well. She says, yes, she doesn't reject what the father has to say. She's not doing that. She says, yes. And that opens us, that allows us to enter heaven because through her, Christ is born. Because she says, yes, she listens to the father. So this idea that you have to reject your father is just utterly ridiculous. And I think it's really evil is what I think Leslie Hedlund is, is actively trying to oppose the Christian story here by saying yes to your father. I think I really think that's what she's going at here. And she's using Star Wars to do that. I mean, it's really, really deranged stuff here from Leslie Hedlund. She then concluded and saying, I do think when he says it's OK, I think you're right. He is imposing on her agency at that point. But I do think in a weird way, she needed it. She needed his acceptance, not his approval, but his acceptance of his fate, I think, is what gives her that energy to do the final fist clench. So I don't think that Soul is saying, I don't know, when I watch it, I don't think that he's saying it's okay for her to kill him. I think he's trying to tell her, like, you don't need to do this. Things will be okay. Like, stop. Uh, I, I don't think he would be advocating for her to murder him. It just doesn't make any sense. It's completely out of character, but that does indeed sound like what Edlin is saying here, that she he is approving of her killing him. It's like, what? What is going on? It's how evil this show is. It's absolutely disgusting. Like, I mean, it, it, it's the whole uh, Torben thing all over again. The guy just self-deletes, and that's exactly what Soul, she's saying Soul is doing here as well. Fortunately, I don't think that's how it actually reads. When you watch the show, I think he's actually trying to reach out to her and be compassionate and try to get her to stop what she's doing. And she clearly doesn't.
And then, as we talked about earlier, it's all a self-insert. And she 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 talks about this in this interview too. She previously kind of talked about this in an interview with the New York Times. She said this to them before the show even released. He says, she said, I have a very strained relationship with my youngest sister. And I feel like one of the reasons it is strained is that we both see each other as the bad guy. If I was going to tell a story about bad guys, it seemed to me that the place to start should be a familial relationship where one person is adamantly convinced of her correctness and the other person is also adamantly convinced of her correctness. She then said that she does not speak with her sister. We don't speak. I think this will be a surprise to her. So it's clearly, it's clearly this is her taking her family drama and trying to work her own her own personal issues out with her own family through a $180 million budget. And remember, Kathleen Kennedy was like, you've written a great Star Wars story. Now I want a Leslie Headland story. Well, that's what we got. We got a self-insert Leslie Headland story about her own personal and family drama. So if we go back to this Collider article, this Collider interview, she provides more evidence to this theory that it's all just a self-insert. She's going through therapy. We're, she's trying to use the show as therapy. I think that's what makes villains so compelling because there is that little piece of every writer in the villains kind of pushing an idea that they have harbored within them. The villain is a great proxy for getting those feelings out. That's what Maggie Lovett says, the Collider interviewer. And then Hedlund responded, basically confirming everything she says. She says, absolutely. I very rarely put myself into the protagonist because I think the protagonist has to be the protagonist. They might have a sprinkling of me. So she says sprinkling, and then she's going to list like literally everything about these characters. Certainly Osha and May, the family conflict, the switching of sides, being really certain that you know one thing, the betrayal of the father, the rejection of the paternal protectionism, and saying, I am now my own person. That stuff I definitely relate with. She's literally admitting that the entire show is about her and is a self-insert and then she actually says this but the stranger is my shadow self for sure so she doesn't actually elaborate on this she kind of did it in a previous interview uh, with collider uh, and she was asked by love it again aside from the obvious allusions to other ships are there any other enemies to lovers dynamics that inform the decisions you are making as you are playing with these two characters so she's talking about relationship between uh, osha and chimer and, let, and Hedlund replied this. There are so many, but I'm going to say no because I was really working from muscle memory. I didn't want it to quote something else. I wanted to just click into the kind of stuff that I wrote when I was in high school. I love these characters. Nobody wants to ship these characters more than I do. I love them so much. I love The Stranger. There's always a character that's an avatar for me that I really, really love. In Russian Doll, it was Charlie Barnett's character, Alan. The stranger is obviously a badass, but I just mean much more than his character. I'm not going around doing fantastic lightsaber battles and murdering people and being an all-around badass, but I would say that what he talks about in this episode and what he talked about in episode five is something I really dug down. So I think I think this is post episode six. Then Osha's inner conflict fits with his ideology, and yet they're on opposite ends of the spectrum. Just like she and her sister started at the beginning of the show, I wanted to stay true to my characters. I tried my best to just stick to the tropes and the stuff that I loved and tried not to think about, especially with the classics. I think it would have been a little too quotes around it if that were the case. So she's literally admitting that the whole show is like her self-insert and that she is indeed evil and villainous. Like that's what she's saying because she's Osha and she, she's also Chimere. Like, Chimir is an avatar for her. That is what she is saying here. I mean, absolutely deranged that this even got approved, that they spent $180 million on a therapy session for Leslie Headland and called it a Star Wars show. It's despicable. But this is what the Walt Disney Company is now. This is what Lucasfilm is now. This is what they do over and over and over again. At least as much as I dislike The Mandalorian, I don't think that Jon Favreau was treating that show as a therapy session for himself. I think he had really good concepts, actually. Uh, he just didn't execute them well. And I think that's throughout. I know lots of people just kind of saw it in, in the third season. I saw it throughout. And I think it really came to a head in the third season. But wow. <laughs> she actually admitted all this stuff. And of course... She had to 
make it so it, it it is the the force is female it's all about the feminism of course it is of course it is soul is just benign sexism towards osha someone he hadn't seen in years and who had kind of like moved on from her until all this stuff uh, resurfaced and may went on her serial killing murder spree well let me know what you guys make of this what do you make of what leslie headland had to say here let me know in the comments below. Remember to always be charitable, especially to each other, but to always speak the truth.